Hey Rayleigh and anybody else watching and welcome back to another message from your father. So we finished up Joshua yesterday and now we're headed into Judges. Really interesting book, uh, Judges. We'll see some pretty bloody and pretty intense stuff, but there's a lot of really good stuff in here as well. Now, where are we entering this from? Well, we finished off with the eastern tribes of the Israelites returning home across the uh, Jordan to their land. We looked at Joshua's farewell, his death, and then a recommitment to God. I say Judges is an interesting book because we see the Israelites, unfortunately, just like us, human. We see them wavering all too often. Now, you heard with the conquering of the land that they've let a lot of people survive. That's not what God wanted, and there are consequences. Exactly what God said through Moses would happen is going to happen. So we'll see that. Uh, we see, even see that as early as the chapters we're reading today, chapters 1 and 2, where we will take a look at Israel's continuing fight against the Canaanites, an angel from Bochim, and, or at Bochim, I should say, and disobedience and defeat, exactly what you would expect. Again, Judges 1 and 2 today. So, chapter 1. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who will be the first to go up and fight for us against the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah is to go. I have given the land into their hands. Then the men of Judah said to the Simeonites, their brothers, Come up with us into the territory allotted to us to fight against the Canaanites. We will in turn go with you into yours. So the Simeonites went with them. <clears throat> when Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and Perizzites into their hands, and they struck down 10,000 men at Bezek. It was there that they found Adonai Bezek and fought against him, putting to rout the Canaanites and Perizzites. Adonai, Berik, or Adonai Bezek fled, but they chased him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Then Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their, 70 th with their thumbs and big toes cut off have picked up the scraps under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. They brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. The men of Judah attacked Jerusalem also and took it. They put the city to the sword and set it on fire. After that, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites living in the hill country, the Negev, and the western foothills. They advanced against the Canaanites living in Hebron, formerly called Kirath Arba, and defeated Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai. From there, they advanced against the people living in Debir, formerly called Kirath Sefer. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter, Asa, in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kirath Sefer. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. So Caleb gave his daughter, Asa, Aksa, to him in marriage. One day, when she came to Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb asked her, What can I do for you? She replied, Do me a special favor. Since you've given me land in the Negev, give me also springs of water. Then Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. The descendants of Moses' father-in-law, the Kenite, went up from the city of Palms with the men of Judah to live among the people of the desert of Judah in the Negev, near Arad. Then the men of Judah went with the Simeonites, their brothers, and attacked the Canaanites living in Zephath, and they totally destroyed the city. Therefore it was called Horma. The men of Judah also took Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron each city with its territory. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had iron chariots. As Moses had promised, Hebron was given to Caleb, who drove from, there, from it the three sons of Anak. The Benjamites, however, failed to dislodge the Jebusites, who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the Benjamites. Now, the house of Joseph attacked Bethel, and the Lord was with them. When they sent men to spy out Bethel, formerly called Luz, the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Show us how to get into the city, and we will see that you are treated well. So he showed them, and they put the city to the sword, but spared the man and his whole family. He then went to the land of the Hittites, where he built a city and called it Luz, which is its name to this day. But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Bethshan or Tanakh or Dor or Ablim, 
or Medigo, and their surrounding settlements, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressured or they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, but the Canaanites continued to live there and to live there among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kitron or Nahal, who remained among them, but they did subject them to forced labor. Nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon, or Alab, or Askid, Akzib, or Helba, or Aphek, or Rehob. And because of this people of Asher, living among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land, neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath. But the Nethophites, too, lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land, and those living in Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became forced laborers for them. The Amorites confined the Danites to hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plain. And the Amorites were determined also to hold out in, to hold out in Mount Herez, Elijah, and Shalabim. But when the power of the house of Joseph increased, they were pressed into forced labor. The boundary of the Amorites was from Scorpion Pass to Salah and beyond. Chapter 2 The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your forefathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? Now, therefore, I tell you that I will not drive them out before you. They will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called that place Bokim. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived them, and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done in Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance, at timnath Herez, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. After the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up, who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They f provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around, whomever were no longer, whom they were no longer able to resist. Wherever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods. They worshipped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was the judge and sa he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to their ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, Because this nation has violated the covenant that I laid down for their forefathers and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive, the, drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk as in, and walk in it as their forefathers did. The Lord had allowed these nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. So again, it's it's a really, it's a bloody book and a depressing book. And unfortunately, I think Judges to a degree is a, at least a predictable book of the human condition. I mean, I look at that and then I see 
so much of my own life, at least, going away from the Lord and drawing near, going away and drawing near. And looking at these judges, it's really interesting as well. Um, we just see the they are imperfect men that are being used by God. And God, both the dogs are joining me now. That's good stuff. Hey, friends. Um, but yeah, so we have these men of God who are absolutely not perfect. And we see that even today, that we don't follow our pastors. We shouldn't. We should be really vetting everything they say through the word of God. If Christ is our example, he is the one we need to follow. So that's my prayer for you, Rayleigh. That though it's tempting to look at man, and I'm I'm speaking to the choir here because it's so it seems so easy to look at imperfect people, but who appear to be in a better condition than we are. That's like aiming for not the center of the bullseye. We need to look to Christ. And so my prayer for you is that you do that, that you don't look to men who are fallen and men who are trying their best. Because as we'll continue to see in Judges, their best isn't good enough. God still blesses them, but these are definitely imperfect men. Anyway, know that I love you and I'm praying for you. My dog is being super needy right now. Uh, for anyone else watching, know that I appreciate you so, so much. And we will plan on seeing you next time. Have a good one.